grew up during the late 60s, early 70s. We never used to go on conventional holidays anywhere. We used to go off to um, communities. There's one community that we went to stay in near the south of France and there just happened to be two old llamas who were residents there. Lovely old llamas. And it was, it was very obvious that they were very happy people, very down to earth. They were great with us as, as kids. They were very gregarious and played with us, turning us upside down and giggling and laughing, very joyous. But at the same time, you know, very, very normal, very nice. That was my introduction really as, as what was to be a spiritual person. And I was inspired. I was very inspired. And obviously, if you, it seems that if you want to be a truly happy person, you needed to pursue the life as, as they did, the life as, as a monk. And I didn't think I was worthy to be a monk. I, didn't, I, I thought, I had this funny idea in my head, because they were so special, that you needed to be a special sort of person to become a monk. But actually, of course, I've learned since then it's <laughs> the other way around, you know. Um, and I, I never really, I never really shared with anybody. But that 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 was my secret thing that I wanted to do. I, I wanted to become a monk. My childhood was full of magic. You know, I had a very happy childhood. I remember meeting the Karmapa. This is the, the 16th Karmapa. And he seemed to be someone just completely, as his name, the Karma Man, that's what it's called, completely in harmony with, with, with the world and karma and just sort of drift, drifted. Sort of, he's like walking on clouds almost with great beams, radiant smiles. And it was extraordinary meeting him for the first time because you have this ceremony where you, you give this white scarf as a, as a gesture. I remember coming into the room and it's just a, a small um, room in a terraced house in, in Birmingham and there was the Karmapa sat on a throne there and, and I, I kind of came up shyly. I was, I don't know how old, 13 years old or something um, and I gave this crumpled up scarf, you know, not very nicely sort of presented like that and he kind of looked at me and he took smiled he was quite amused by it unraveled the thing looped it round the back of my head pulled the two ends together like that held the two ends together with one hand and slid the other hand up so it got tighter and tighter to my throat and pulled me into the the, the table at the front of the throat and as he held me there he turned and he looked to the other llamas who were sitting on the floor of the eminent teachers like that and said something in Tibetan I wish I didn't know Tibetan time. I wish I knew what, what he what he said. And they said something, and then looked at me, smiled, and then and let go. And it felt it felt like like he'd sort of caught me like a fish and wheeled me in. And you know, seems to be quite pleased about that. And then, yeah, it was an extraordinary little thing, very very small thing, but but it meant a, a lot to me. This series is called Laughing in the Face of Death and it's dealing with five emotions that, that we all experience. The first one of these is, is dealing with, with anger, so it's very dark, ghostly looking, has a, a more of a, an angry face. And then this moves on to the next skull, which is red in colour. This is laughing in the face of, of attachment. Then on to the next one, which is, is pride, laughing in the face of pride, the colour of earth, and from, from the earth there's, there comes all the riches. And then to laughing in the face of jealousy is to, to see everybody as, as the same. Everybody is equal, we're all equal, we're all in the same boat together. And then the last one is laughing in the face of stupidity. This one is the root really of all the other emotions because without the stupidity, we wouldn't fall together. When you're a monk and you're living in a monastery, 
you, you really, and especially in a retreat situation, you have very little distractions. Everything's kind of stripped away, if you like. So even the simplest things would give you immense pleasure. And I think that's a really important thing to learn, especially in this day and age where pleasure is, is sought after by, by having more things. Materialism, houses and relationships and all this sort of thing, the more things that make you happy, but actually it's the, it's the reverse. Look at this, gold leaf, real gold on, on a, a... This is an agate stone, and it's really quite good to, to rub on. You can burnish the gold afterwards with it, but I tend to use it to rub down the gold, gold leaf into the area. There's always a little bit that gets left behind. It's becoming harder and harder even in the West to live a monk because society doesn't allow it. So it's kind of an old-fashioned thing to do, really. If you have the ability to be able to sit quietly and, and to, to practice and to med meditate, then you don't necessarily have to be a monk. But the problem is, is not being a monk is you do have to spend an awful lot of time earning your living. <laughs> and there isn't so much time to sit and meditate. If you have a glass table, and if you don't wipe it every day from, from the dust, because specks of dust will fall, it'll become such a thick carpet of dust, you won't even see this glass coffee table, you can't even see through it. So it's the same idea for meditation, is that if you do it regularly, on a regular basis, it's like wiping the dust off every day.